Great, thanks, Liz. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Vanderark, CEO of Getting Smart. Uh, we're here to share the power of place. This is a 90-minute workshop that's part of the ASU GSV conference. Um, we are going to be talking about making um, your community the classroom. We have a terrific group of panelists today. Um, I'd love to introduce them. Uh, Kiana Patterson is with Hopskip Drive. Uh, she's going to give you a unique view of place and in the new era of, uh, of high mobility. Dr. Aaron English uh, is the Director of Innovation for San Diego County. Uh, Nate McLennan heads innovation for Teton Science School as well as their national place network. He's also the co-author of a great new book conveniently called The Power of Place uh, that uh, we're going to be drawing from today. We also have Iana, um, Ayana Verde, the founder uh, and director of the Verde Eco School, a really cool place-based uh, micro school in, uh, in Florida. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to ask each of them uh, to tell us their story of place. And I'd love to have you guys um, that have joined us um, think about this as well. Think about a time when place registered in your development, when you can think about how a place began to influence what you were learning or even who you were becoming. Uh, this is the first gratuitous picture of my granddaughter, Wonder Woman. Um, we spend a lot of time at this place called Rocky Point when it's uh, low tide on uh, the Puget Sound. I'm hoping that her story of place um, is is at least in part connected to uh, to Rocky Point and uh, walks with her with her grandfather. Um, would love to have you guys uh, share in chat kind of a headline of your story of place. Uh, while we do that, I'm going to ask our um, ask our panelists to uh, to talk about how place has influenced who they've become. Uh, I want to start with Kiana Patterson. Hey everyone, thanks for being here. Um, I, I like to tell people that in a past life I was a teacher. Um, and I taught uh, public school, middle school, um, sixth grade English and history. And we studied um, the beginning of man to the fall of Rome. So we went on an adventure to all of these places in time and history. And over the course of the years, I've been able to go to so many of these places that I once taught about, which really brought to life all the things. So in the picture, you see me at the Great Wall of China, you see me in Rome, you see me in Dubai, um, just some phenomenal places that I think really bring to life um, and bring into context what I formerly as a teacher used to uh, teach uh, my own students and how important that is for you to make that connection with what you're learning um, and what you're seeing and feeling at times. Thank you, Kiana. And uh, thanks, Brian. He talked about uh, outdoor expeditions in Yellowstone and the Teton. Uh, that's going to register with uh, one of, another one of our panelists. Before we get to Nate, um, Aaron, you've, you've had some similar learning to travel experiences that have registered for you, right? Absolutely, and thanks for um, calling on me. Uh, my, my, the one that resonated mostly when we first started our conversations about eight months ago about place is my trip to Jordan. I went with an organization called the... Um, Oh, the global nomads, they invited me to go on a teaching and learning expedition. So we went there with other um, educators and I had never been anywhere in the Middle East before. I've been traveling in, you know, like the Virgin Islands, Hawaii, a lot of tropical places, never had been to the Middle East before. And it absolutely changed my perspective of everything because I was actually able to uh, get into the homes of people and talk to them about, ask them questions, ask them questions about why and how and, and uh, their experiences. It changed my life, and that was about four or five years ago. It just completely changed me. So it places everything, because if you take us out of the four walls that we're traditionally learning in, and we decide that 
anywhere can be the place we learn. And that, that's what we have to focus on because anywhere is a learning, especially as a child. So that's where I'm yeah. going to focus a little bit of my time on in a conversation I have in a few minutes. This is both for you, Aaron, and for uh, Kiana. It's interesting that travel uh, based learning is those memories are so connected to our senses. When I think about visiting these places that you've mentioned, I think about the things that I saw, the things that I tasted, the things that I smelled. I think about the favorite meal that I had in those places. I bet you have memories like that. Oh, there was food that we ate that was the most scrumptious food that yeah, we, but it wasn't just the food, Tom. It was the experience of eating yeah slowly dining and you know not big fancy places we were in little shops and you know but one of them was they brought a hookah piper and these people were smoking a hookah pipe i've never seen a whole restaurant everyone that was part of what they did after they ate they, they put a little pipe on and all these families the families mother father children they were all doing this little pipe passing the thing around and just watching such a different culture and learning from that and the smells were it's um it was amazing and the food was spectacular I, uh, Kiana, I want to go back to you and, and see if you, um, if you had a, a, a meal or a, a story like that, that, that from one of these places that registers. Um, yeah, I think that um, probably visiting the Great Wall of China was uh, just uh, an amazing yeah. Thing for me and that that connection walking alongside and knowing from when I taught that you know several of the people many many thousands of people who contributed to the building of the Great Wall of China died there and that oftentimes their bodies were buried and so trapped inside of this wall is is people who you know pour their blood and sweat and tears into this wall this monument that you can even see from space and I think for me as you know the digital age that we live in today, you know, me posting these pictures of myself traveling on Instagram and now my former students um, following me on Instagram and, and asking me questions and being reminded, literally just seeing the photo of me um, in China on the Great Wall brings them back to when we were, when I was teaching them about the Great Wall of China. And that to me was like the biggest connection because it was just them seeing that visual that took them back to that sixth grade classroom. I, you know, you're, your story reminded me of a poem that Mason and I liked by Alfred Korn. Um, it's a story uh, about just watching the breeze through the trees and then he starts to think about the, the epics of change that have happened standing there. So thinking about history in a place and you just reminded me of you're in this place but you're thinking about the thousands of years of history that have, um, have taken place there. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I want to note Lori's uh, story about growing up a free-range kid. Lori, I totally appreciate that. I think when it became summer, my mom said, you know, come back in the fall. Uh, don't hurt yourself. Um, and I had months at a time of uh, being a free-range kid. So I appreciate that. Nate, you, you grew up on a, on a farm. Um, would love to know the sure. memories you think about. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom, and uh, thanks, everybody. Excited to be on this, this, uh, with this group today and with the audience. So I grew up on a farm in New England. Um, we had sheep and chickens uh, and a lot of land to explore. So um, I don't think I realized uh, until I moved out to the north and have been out here ever since um, and really dove into place-based education when I got out here even though both my parents were educators, but I don't know if it was unintentional or intentional that they settled on that piece of land uh, for me and my three brothers to grow up. But most of my real experience in learning happened at that place and on that place. And Tom, if you flip to the next slide. So when I look back at my childhood experiences um, and I look back at all the things that I experienced in that place. Uh, we had photovoltaics on our roof. Uh, we were writing and thinking about the woods around us. Uh, we had gardens and uh, uh, we did all sorts of compost experiments and health and wellness because we all were running around um, playing sports and running around in the woods uh, building forts. So, so I think um, I am realizing now that the stickiest learning moments of our lives 
come when we are immersed in a place. And so that has transferred well to my, really my 25 year career in education where I've become increasingly convinced that when we make the community as a classroom or we make learning ecosystems available to students, which all of us will talk about, is uh, we make students are, are learning much more relevant. And it'll be that 30 year memory rather than the five minute memory that so much of education is built on. Yeah, no, I, I love that. What, what experience are kids gonna remember 20 years from now? That's why I snuck that gratuitous picture of my granddaughter. I, I wanna be intentional about creating experiences that she'll remember 20 years from now. Aaron, I, I wonder if you wanna pop on and talk about maps especially in Boston where you really need a map. Can you unmute and, um, and talk about maps? And I think he's talking to you, Aaron Goldstein. Hey there. Uh, yeah, I, um, I live in, in Back Bay, which is just about the heart of Boston. And right. I, whereas I, I've, I've lived here for about seven years, so um, biking all over the city. So at this point, what I tell people is, uh, I know just about every street within a five mile radius of where I live. And I give tours of Back Bay and uh, set the South End and I can do that just anywhere else and uh, look at all the architecture. And that's just come from, from living in a place for so long. It, it's interesting, Aaron. I remember uh, before GPS of being um, lost as hell in um, in Boston, where there are no street, um, right? So, you, I, I think uh, for a lot of people in places like that, the, their experiences are linked to maps and sort of coming to understand the geography. I've I've also enjoyed watching my granddaughters um, start using GPS, um, and my my five year old granddaughter likes to have a map in front of her when we're going somewhere. Um, and she's developing this geospatial um, awareness that's often tied to, uh, to place. So I appreciate that story of coming to understand a, a place from a geospatial uh, point of view. Um, you know what that made me think of? It made me yes. think of, you know, we live on the West Coast, and so it's really easy for us to understand what is West based on where the ocean is, where the water right. is, right? And so we right. do have kids. I like to, it's bringing up the equity issue and certainly kids in rural areas, what, what are some things, landmarks that they can set their sight on that actually helps with that geospatial sort of mapping in their head and their surroundings and, yeah. and understanding directionally what, where is what and how important that is. I'm gonna, I'll come right back, Ayana, I promise. but. So I grew up in Denver, where you have the Front Range, and um, this is a picture of Mount Evans, which is just west of town, so you always know which direction west is, right? So it's super easy in Colorado, or at least in Denver, to be geospatially oriented, because you look west and you can see um, Mount Evans, so you kind of always know what direction you're heading. Uh, it's not true if you're in Boston, especially on a street that, uh, that doesn't go, uh, go straight. I'm, I wonder, um, Kiana, do you, do you know if any kids sort of can use your app to, to track where they are yeah, while they're so, traveling? Yeah, that's the, the beauty of sort of our technology, both parents and students, uh, as long as they have the, download, the app downloaded, they know where they're at in relationship to where they're going and coming from and how long, um, uh, you know, uh, long the, the, the trip will be, right? So we're estimating. Yeah time to arrival as well and then it when they're waiting for the the right the driver to pick them up they know how far away and can see on a map where they're at as well yeah N nate you can probably also relate to knowing which direction west is living um living in the tetons right you, you always have the tetons are west yeah, it's pretty pretty easy to navigate compared to where I grew up in New England, where it was just rolling forest. Here, you go through the mountains, and that's always the west. <laughs> I like so just Nate? rolling forest. I like that, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> or, or rolling forest, maybe not just. <laughs> I think I think um, in the in the in the chat is saying that in Boston, the landmark is the Charles River. So, uh, yes. with respect to being in that that New England area. Um, so I. 
I grew up, I uh, did middle and high school um, and college in, in Colorado. And so when I, I, I live in Seattle now, but anytime when I fly in and I can see Mount Evans, it, it feels like home to me. So it's a, an example of home being deeply embedded as a sense of identity, you know, about who I am and the, the experiences that I had. And um, who, who was it? Laurie talked about being a free range kid. The minute I turned 16, I got a, an old jalopy and drove into the hills. And I can't believe my parents let me do that. But without a map or anything, I could just drive into the back country around Mount Evans and, um, and camp and hike. And so it was a big part of, uh, of who I became. And it's, um, it's why I studied geology. I think, Brian, you talked about that as well. Um, so these kind of outdoor experiences influenced who I was becoming and what I decided to study uh, in college. I want to go back and um, and grab um, Ayana. Tell us about your story of place. Hi, thank you, Tom. And it's great to be here. My name is Ayana Verdi. I'm the founder of the Verde Eco School. The Verde Eco School is an urban farm school that uses the community as its campus. Uh, interestingly enough, I grew up far away from uh, a wild natural environment. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, and I could tell no you way. where the closest train station is, and I could tell you how to get uptown <laughs> or downtown. <laughs> But, that, but that's about as good a, a, as my uh, geospatial awareness would have been when I was a young kid. So it was interesting to have these, these experiences as an adult and essentially what began this, this journey for me to, to share an idea of an urban farm school as the center of a community is I spent some time in New Zealand studying to become a veterinarian. And during my time in New Zealand, I noticed something that I thought was really beautiful about the educational system there, and that was a really strong connection to the indigenous people, um, the Maori people, and how they walk through the world. Um, and something that I noticed is that the Maori people spend a lot of their time, and the Kiwis, the New Zealanders as well, as a result, barefoot. And I asked a lot of questions about this custom or this cultural difference because, you know, growing up in New York City, you're not walking anywhere without your shoes on. <laughs> but in New Zealand, the, the Maori people believe that they learn more, they learn better when their feet have a direct connection to the earth beneath them. And I just thought that that was a beautiful thing, a beautiful awareness where you could see children running barefoot to schools and lines of shoes outside of buildings. Um, and it was that experience that I brought back with me when I came to the United States to say that we need more. We, meet, we need more connection to our place and our unique environments. And we need to do more to give children an opportunity to explore sans shoes if necessary. <laughs> I love that. Do you have to, uh, are you going to tell us how you got to Florida or can you do that now? Sure. So, um, after New Zealand, we moved back to the United States and spent a, a bit of time uh, trying to find a great educational fit for my son. Uh, and we started in New Jersey, which was a, a wonderful, there was a wonderful public school district there and just had this eye-opening experience surrounding what we believe to be developmentally appropriate education for children. Um, and my young, newly five-year-old son had about 15 minutes outdoors to explore the natural world every day. Most of his time was spent with a pencil at a desk, sitting in a chair. And, and it was jarring to me to come back from somewhere like New Zealand, <laughs> where there was so much immersion in, in nature and the natural world to see that that's what we thought was appropriate for young children who really need to be spending most of their time exploring, getting dirty, you know, coming home with mud in their shoes. Um, so we left New Jersey, went down to Florida, enrolled in a private school in Miami. That was a, a really close approximation of the same experience that we had in New Jersey. And we said, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna homeschool. So we looked for uh, 
an area in Florida and found that Brevard County, which is where we are, has the fastest growing population of homeschoolers in the nation. Um, it's interestingly enough, a, a large population of engineers, individuals who are working at places like SpaceX and, and, um, and Collins here. So we started our journey just thinking that we were going to create a wonderful holistic experience for our son and met a community of people who said, why don't we do this together? So our first oh. classroom was on a community garden here at the center of an art, a historic arts district. And we went from 12 students, so five families that we began with, and, and now we're pushing 80 students in the, the last wow. What a cool journey. Um, <laughs> I, I love, in, in chat, I love how Laura talked about, this is a part of her free range upbringing. Um, it allowed me to develop a curious, bold, and independent adventurer. I love that sense. I think you appreciate that, and I think you're trying to incorporate that into your school, right? It's important that we give children opportunities to explore fearlessly, you know, without injecting this idea of the overabundance of caution, go get dirty, go make mistakes, go trip and fall, um, experience your world heartily, which is what we ask our students to do. Yeah, and I, um, the other day you were, when we were doing our little planning talk, I had to share with my grandchildren that we heard some strange noises coming the, from the background of where she was at. And we all kind of were standing there perplexed. We'd all been, you know, dogs have walked across our laps, cat, cats have jumped on our screens. And, and uh, we said, Yana, what do, you, what do you have back there? And she turned on her camera and there was a big giant giraffe just hanging right over her. <laughs> and I, went, That's, and I shared, shared that story with my grandchildren and then threw them outside. But um, <laughs> just, it was such a neat story. Hey, Mason, you want to pop on and, and read a little David White just for Ayana's sake? For sure, yeah. Uh, David White's a great poet, and it made me think of this line. Um, it is the man throwing away his shoes as if to enter heaven and finding himself astonished, opened at last, falling in love with the solid ground. Uh, love just, that. Yeah, love the idea of removing shoes and kind of becoming additionally aware of where you are. And it, and yeah, it check, I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say check out um, The Heart Aroused is a, a terrific book. He's got 20 or 30 books of poetry. Um, David came and spoke at my administrator's retreat when I was a school superintendent 20 years ago. And just a, has a beautiful sensibility uh, and a poet that is particularly oriented towards people working together on a cause. So thank you, Mason. Go ahead, Ayana. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I found it particularly profound that the Native people knew this intuitively, that they knew that there was this connection to the earth that yeah. allowed them to open their awareness to a greater degree. You know, something that we seem to have lost now with all of our shoes. <laughs> but, but they knew it and they, they've been able to insert that into the culture of an entire country. Um, so I just think it's, it's a, a beautiful custom. Um, Mason, maybe you can uh, drop a, a link in chat to the podcast we posted yesterday from Joanne McKechn. She's a New Zealand educator with a beautiful um, commitment to contributive learning. The idea of, of helping, equipping young people to make a difference in their community. And she has this beautiful way of um, encouraging young people to make an addition. She said, it's really about what you add, you know, not what you take. And um, so I think she would appreciate that, uh, that sentiment, Ayana, thank you. So uh, now we're gonna, and by the way, if you've joined us um, since we started, we, we just talked about our story of place, how each of us has at a different time in our life um, found place unusually meaningful to our learning and development. And we, we headline those in chat. So if you've joined us and you'd like to share uh, a headline about how place was influential in your development, please do that. In the second section, uh, we're gonna talk about how place plays a role in identity development, how it helps us develop a sense of purpose, um, how every place is a place that has something to teach 
And then uh, I mentioned at the beginning, Nate and I uh, wrote uh, a great new book together called The Power of Place. That, um, that book has three themes in it, um, equity, agency, and community. We're gonna talk about strategies for, uh, for uh, all three of those. And then we're going to uh, talk about uh, the way tools can enrich um, place-based learning. Nate, would love to have you um, give us a definition of place-based education and specifically how you guys think about it at Teton Science. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So uh, we, we put the definition up here as we defined it in the book. So place-based education is anywhere, anytime learning that leverages the power of place to personalize learning. And I think after hearing all the stories that we uh, were shared on the chat and also uh, presenters were talking about, I think one of our, our big ideas is to take something that is the oldest form of education. I think place-based education is not a novel idea. It, all education had to be place based at first. It was, it ensured the survival of families and groups of people, et cetera. So, so um, when we take that and then explore what's happening now over the last hundred years in education, uh, our, our work was around how do we build capacity in schools and teachers and learners to use the learner ecosystem to uh, really enhance learning and then build this idea of agency, people feeling like they can make a difference, community that they are understanding how to strengthen communities and equity that every uh, learner, every young person has the ability to make change happen. So we think about place in a couple different aspects. One is this idea of the economic um, side of place, the other is ecological, and then the third is the social, political, cultural side. And so, so when we think about place-based education, we try to have students understand that there are, in every place they go to, they'll find those pieces and parts. Um, and they're going to look different in every place. Yeah, Nate, Let's just let's repeat those because that's such a cool and important lens that triangle when so when you think about entering a place you're thinking about what are the three? Yeah, so thinking about the economy of a place the economy the ecology of a place and then the social political or cultural aspects of a place and and when yeah. I when I now drive even drive through communities my brain is wired to think that way and so that a lot of our place-based learning experiences are based on making sure students understand that and in that way understanding where they want to make a difference uh, because yeah, they need to understand I, how the, the community functions first. No, and you, you guys really, you taught me that um, when we started hanging out together five years ago. Um, I, I think like maybe some folks on the, on the call, um, I thought about place from a STEM standpoint, right? That it was a science exploration or that it was all about the ecology, but I, I love how you guys think about who who lives here and what do they do for a living and what's the culture and what do they eat um, in in the same way that Ayana um, talked to her about her experience in New Zealand. So I appreciate the multi-dimensional approach that you guys continue to teach me about. Yeah, and it makes it more accessible. And I think it, that, that really ties into the reason we, we wrote this book that uh, Emily Liebtag and Tom and I collectively started thinking about, we know this idea is out there. It's been sitting in the STEM world. Uh, it's been sitting in environmental education programs, uh, alternative micro schools, things like that for a long, long time. Uh, John Dewey was talking about it in the early 1900s, et cetera. So, but what our interest was, how do we, how do we make this accessible enough to mainstream it and put it at the center. Because if we, if the, if the purpose of education is to help make the world better and equip young people to make the world a better place, we need to make sure that there's an accessible format they can do that in an accessible approach. So that's why we wrote the book. Um, we, we timed it. Uh, I'm not sure it was totally appropriate, but it wasn't planned that way. We, we, we started four years ago, finished 400 days ago and launched when COVID erupted. Um, and, and community has continued to play an important role especially as a lot of students are at home so uh, appropriately timed but not intentionally so right tell us about the design principles sure and and uh, we clearly acknowledge that we uh, that there are other design principles out there for us we wanted to codify the language because we saw over 30 years of place-based education a lot of people were talking about a lot of different things and there was a lot of different fiefdoms out there and so we simplified it down into these six uh, to make it accessible and shareable. And so 
The first two are around community as a classroom and local to global. Uh, and, and community as a classroom is what we've all been talking about. Local to global is how do we connect it to global phenomena. Uh, the second two, the second partner set of partners in the principles are inquiry, which is understanding what is in the world through real specific pedagogy and inquiry based teaching. And then design thinking is how do we, um, what do we do when we figure out there's a challenge or an opportunity to solve? And oftentimes um, in, in schools, we might do good inquiry work, but then we never finish the project. And design thinking gives us some great tools for that. And then the last two, learner-centered is emerging as more and more important as we learn more and more about the neurodiversity of every learner and how do we make, uh, do culturally relevant pedagogy and how do we make sure that every child is met uh, when they need it and where they need it and can progress uh, to their full potential. And then interdisciplinary, of, co of course, the world is interdisciplinary and we want to mimic and match that in the worlds uh, of education in K-12. So we use this as our core framework at Teton Science Schools and any of the network of schools that we work with um, both nationally and internationally. I think these are such a cool uh, set of design principles. Do any of our other panelists want to express their own uh, admiration for these really cool design principles? <laughs> or, or argue against them. I don't know if it has to be admired. <laughs> well, no, you know, I think, Erin, these really ground your practice as well, absolutely. right? Absolutely. We were doing some exploration when we were actually going to be doing this physically. Remember, remember the day where we were almost going to meet for the ASG? <laughs> that was uh, back a while ago. We started walking around the San Diego Bay, the San Diego Harbor, and we had a, um, a biologist with us. And what she was also, she was a teacher at High Tech High. And she, we started talking about what all, and you mentioned it, Tom, you said the, um, the different, uh, play, you know, commerce, um, how the, the uh, child, you know, there, there was three things you mentioned, I think it was Nate. But we started looking at it through the commerce lens, the, this, the bay. And we started giving each other these lessons on the history of the bay, the water rights, the the um, the navy, how the navy had uh, had a place in this. It was really a powerful conversation, and I'll never look at that bay the same way again. Um, Ayana, th these design principles, while you express them slightly differently, are really uh, what your what the Verde Eco School is all about, right? Absolutely, and. Uh, I was able to go with our director of education for a place-based uh, workshop in Wyoming with some uh, Teton science uh, educators who led us through this process and it has really grounded our practice at our school. So our project-based um, courses actually use this as the skeleton of our rubrics. So we're looking at each piece to say, um, where are our community as classroom principals? How are we showing um, enough immersion in these areas? Where's our design thinking? Are we starting with empathy and working toward a solution that ends with the user in mind? So all of these principles ha have really allowed us to um, settle into our practice as a place-based school. Regionally, there are no other schools that are doing what we're doing. So we had to reach right. out really, really far and say, well, I guess we're going to Wyoming <laughs> and bring it and bring it back to our place and make it relevant, make it relevant for us. One thing That's that, awesome. I, one thing that yeah. I would add, uh, Tom, is that what I really like about um, um, Nate's model, I mean, his, this design principle and also from the previous slide, him focused on every community, essentially there's an economy of it. There's the sort of ecology of it and there's a socio-political, right? And what that sort of signals to me is that he is um, acknowledging that every community has that. There, so there is no deficit. Right, every community actually has this and how important that is so that kids don't think that, well, if I live close to the harbor, then somehow that's better, right? Or it's it's more magical or 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 better for my learning, right? And I really like that he shifted that to sort of ground in like all communities have that and all communities yeah. have value. And so all kids won't live near the beach or live in Wyoming but that doesn't right. make their, their community any less than those other communities. Yeah. Really like, I wanted to highlight how amazing that is. Yeah. Nate just uh, put that in chat, really. It's all places are special. Every place is a place and has something to teach. 
Hey, Laurie, do you want to pop on and talk about the blended consortium? Because it sounds like you guys have a cool mixture of um, of online learning um, and, and a real commitment to place. Where is the blended consortium, Laurie? It's in the it's in the Bay Area. I'm working from Western New York, but I was in the Bay for 20 years, and I taught at three of our seven schools, and so you know, a real enthusiast for what we do um, for a number of reasons. I think because there's a spirit of collaboration and of kind of sharing and playing in a, in a sandbox together amongst our schools. But then there's also, you know, this liberty of like freeing ourselves or these the courses we offer through Blend Ed, of freeing ourselves from the school schedule and being able to use time differently and you know and and take more of a project-based approach take more of a um you know kind of an immersive and and for many of the courses some of the courses lend themselves really well to being a place-based course we have a new course this fall that's all about oakland and looking at lots of different political and entertainment and you know kind of social justice issues related to Oaktown or Oakland, and we have um, a wilderness studies, which is an experiential course that look at, that compares wilderness. Well, before the pandemic, they would actually go and compare wilderness in um, Montana with California, um, and that course was completely. You know, we had to pull the plug on so many of the Plan A, Plan B, Plan C, but they've. It's fascinating to see the feedback coming in from students who are in that course and how they are really looking at wilderness and, and place in very new ways, even though they're taking this course as a, as a purely online course, which was not the original yeah. design. No, but it's a, it's a beautiful example of what I think everybody on this panel would like to see more of it now that, you know, 35 million kids are learning remotely, we, we would love to see a mixture of place-based projects with with online learning. So we, we appreciate your early leadership there, especially around health and vulnerable populations. In chat, I, uh, I popped a link to futurefocusededucation.org. Uh, it's an Albuquerque school support organization that has three kind of second chance high schools, alternative high schools for kids not well served in the traditional system. One of them is focused on health and they teach each one of those kids to be a health advocate for themselves, their family and their community. Each one of them gets a paid internship in the community working with a health uh, provider. And we just talked to them yesterday. They've scrambled and made all of those either virtual internships or hybrid internships they do the same thing in construction and entrepreneurship so another great example uh like you've pointed out laurie of, of blended learning plus really community connected learning uh that really brings out the voice and choice and um and and place-based connection for kids so thanks for adding that um now we're we're going to talk about the case for place, and and each of us are going to give you kind of a a, a short overview of why we think place um, has something to teach. And we're going to start with Kiana. So uh, thanks, Tom. Um, there's just been some amazing things I've been jotting down. This explore fearlessly, using time differently, which is what Lori just said, and. Um, that really sort of sets the stage for the work that I'm doing at Hop Skip Drive. We're the leading rideshare uh, company. Uh, we operate in about eight states and in DC, and we literally are an innovative transportation solution for school districts and parents and, and other groups um, to really address this, this critical challenge of reimagining and removing barriers that uh, present themselves to uh, kids getting from place point A to point B. And so it, as we think about like exploring fearlessly, and, and, and I, Tom, I know that I can say this to you, um, if we want children to explore fearlessly when we have to actually have all of the decision makers, the teachers, the administrators actually expand their idea of what school is, right? And where it is at any given time and how they yeah. can administer, right? And lead fearlessly uh, without those barriers. So we know 
at hop skip drive and certainly i know that oftentimes if you have a rigid schedule if you have set routes of school buses that essentially makes it really difficult for you to allow for to your point um uh, students who are in a hybrid school program who all have a different internship at different times of the day in different parts of the city how would you actually be able to do that and 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 if you were Ayana growing up, you would probably be able to take a subway fairly easy, right? If the uh, the internship was relatively close on a route. And so for us, what we're really thinking about is how does transportation actually serve as a barrier to you actually building out a program or a system that enables uh, learning to happen anywhere, right? And not confined to one specific area uh, where a student could either walk or all kids would go to the same place at the same time. Um, so what we enable is the flex flexible scheduling and allows for, I, I think what we all want is we want children to be able to explore and youth to be able to explore where, where and what they might want to do in the future. And the only way that we know that they can actually do that is hands-on learning, actually getting exposed to it. So having flexible work-based locations, even intra-campus. What if so, some awesome classes are in one campus, but not, and, and they're not in another place and you wanna be able to get kids going back and forth between a campus. Right now, that's yep. almost impossible to do. Um, and, and especially when you're in a densely packed uh, urban location it might you have to uh, you know uh, account for time travel traffic all those kinds of things Tom you know the five in Seattle is is gridlock right in normal times nightmare and, and, and then reliability, right? So how do you trust and, and think what happens if a, you know, a bus breaks down or there's an accident? So all of those things really pose a real challenge. And what we, we aim to do at Hop, Skip, Drive is to remove that barrier. So if you are um, a school, and I think on the next slide, I talk about this. If you are a school like uh, Losinger here in Southern California, you would actually be able to uh, not have that as a big barrier that you can plan for anything and then reimagine what work based and place based education would look like if transportation was no longer a barrier. It's a super cool concept and it really does unlock um, opportunities for groups of kids and for individual students. You know, think about that example that I just gave in Albuquerque where you've got high schools committed to every student having a paid internship. So in some cases you have two kids or three kids going to one health provider and other, you have uh, one student. Some of those may have transportation, but most of them uh, don't. And so a partnership with a, a group like Hop, Skip, Drive can really unlock um, equitable opportunity for all learners. So we, we really appreciate what, what you guys are doing. Um, Aaron, tell us about the outdoor ed program in San Diego. Well, this is a, just the most amazing program. It's been um, it running for 75 years, our outdoor program. So that is one of the longest running programs in the United States. And we have served over a million kids and typically it's sixth grade camp. So sixth graders for, with their whole class, they come up to the mountains and it's only about an hour, about an hour and a half away, depending on where you're coming from in San Diego. So it's a bus ride. They go there and they spend a whole week there. And the teachers that are there are there all the time. So the teachers are serving all of those kids. And you can switch it to the next slide, Tom, or whoever's, Liz or whoever's running that. Thank you so much. Um, so it's a it's a immersive program, and what they talk touch upon is they touch upon science and citizen um, citizen science projects. I was there one day where the kids were doing collections on butterflies that they were spotting, and they were putting the uh, everyone who spotted these certain butterflies, they put it into a spreadsheet. But then they would share the information with the local university, and the university was gathering that data, and they were, that was their citizen citizen scientist project. It was just amazing. Um, they they make things, and I have heard, and I've heard it from like numerous generations, from grandparent all the way down to grandchild, that they have kept their little their little uh, things that they make up there. So the kids, it means so much to them the little projects, and they're making um, like leather bookmarks or 
some of you know other kind of things that it's just that they're keeping but the whole idea of this it's a bonding project they eat together they the kids um, in a big um, area before before COVID, of course they're in a big um, auditorium and then they sleep in little um in the little bunk areas and it's just completely immersive and the kids love it it's life-changing they come back and the whole group is bonded and i've, I've been at, at my a former position, I have, was a principal in San Diego for nine years, and we always sent our, this was a big deal, we always send our kids up there, and I get a chance to go up there because being the principal, that's one of the perks, that was the, one of the best perks, is I got to go to sixth grade camp, and I, I got to hang out with them, and I get to see one of the most powerful stories of this is the kids that have no confidence when they get up there, and one of the things is they have to do rock climbing, and when they're doing these rock climbing projects, they're really hard. They're, I mean, literally hard. I was trying to pull myself up and, and you know, they didn't laugh at me, but um, so they were helping the, the other, they were cheering the kids on. So the kids that had no confidence to start would be cheered on by their classmates. And in, in the rock climbing one, for instance, they were cheering this kid on. The, he, this little boy, just his brain, his head almost popped off by the time he got down off that hill. <laughs> he was so excited, not because of what he did, but because of the kids that were cheering him on. And it was a beautiful thing. And it, it's, a, it's a wonderful program that San Diego County Office of Ed um, does. And you could switch to the next, I think you did. Did you switch to the next one? Yeah. So that, that's, uh, that's our program. It's been 75 years, like I said. And um, I'm sad it's not, it's my, my grandson this year is in sixth or seventh grade. He missed it. He was supposed to go right when the COVID hit uh, last year. And now he's in seventh grade. And I keep trying to, figure out ways to get his whole class to get up there, to get up to sixth grade camp. That's great. Um, Aaron, Aaron, there's, you know, there's kids in San Diego County that have never been to the back country like this. There's kids in San Diego County that have never seen the beach. And so I, I, I appreciate oh, yeah. um, the outdoor ed program. I was a principal uh, of the school and I was shocked that the kids had not, this was 20 minutes from the beach because of their transport. This is where I was thinking as Kiana, if they only right. had that transportation, but they couldn't, the parents just didn't have the means to take them to the right. beach. It was a luxury. It was beyond, you know, they had to go food, gas, or the beach. And yep. the beach was not something that they could, that was in their, their wheelhouse at all. So thanks for being sensitive to that. Uh, Kiana, give, give, give us the pitch for Fair day. What's the what's the case for place that you share with families? Sorry, I can't forget to unmute here. <laughs> so our case for place is um, certainly that we are a unique school in a region that I think sometimes grapples with um, being a little bit radical with education and and jumping on. Um, jumping on to, to new old models of education uh, that seem a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> so um, as, a, as an urban farm school, we view regenerative agriculture as the centerpiece of our academic curriculum. Uh, regenerative agriculture meaning agriculture that heals the community, that heals the environment, doesn't take from it or poison it. Um, so our, our community campus runs right alongside the Indian River Lagoon in Melbourne, Florida. Mm. The Indian River Lagoon is one of the most biodiverse estuaries in the world. Um, and we also grapple with toxic algae blooms and sewage uh, that runs right into the lagoon. Uh, so students have partnered with our local natural resources department to do waterway surveys. So they get out on kayaks, get out into the middle of the lagoon um, and take samples of water at different points during the year to get a better understanding of why this is happening, where it's coming from and, and how we can do more to educate our communities as it tends to be you know, the regular homeowner who may spray fertilizer on their lawn then trim their lawn and everything goes running off in, into the lagoon. Um, so as a place-based school, we're 100% um, project-based as well. We have learned that we will always be actively learning about the challenges that face our community. 
every day, you know, something new is taught to us, whether it's on a walk down the street to our community garden, or whether a student it was dropped off and has a really interesting question about a sign that they saw a few blocks over. Um, so about 75% of our school day is spent outdoors. So we've learned Very really, cool. we've learned really quickly how to honor the local weather. In Florida, it is hot or it's raining or there's thunder. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, students learn, uh, students learn a lot about their place when they're out in it and when they're immersed in it. So just this past wow. year on a, on just a walk between our community garden and our schoolhouse, uh, we have some historical plaques that are honoring individuals who lived in the area. And our students, and these are students maybe eight years old to 12 years old, noticed that there was a theme about every single person on a plaque. And every single person on the plaque was a man and he was white. And our students said, where are the women? Where are the people of color? So our students started a project to learn about the people of color who should be honored in their community, who were not yet honored on a plaque. Yeah. And they learned that a nationally True. celebrated author lived a block away from our schoolhouse. So Zora Neale Hurston uh, wrote um, some of her essays, and, and I believe um, a short portion of one of her more famous works, it'll come to me shortly, um, a block away from our schoolhouse. So they did this entire project, presented to their local city council to say, this is an injustice. We need a plaque for Zora Neale Hurston around the corner. She used to live right here. You know, um, so you know, that's the power of place-based learning. That's the power of being outdoors and capturing things and learning things that you just, you didn't know the day before. That's the power of civic engagement and that's the power of learner-based curricula. What do they want to know about? What are they passionate about? Follow the students. So, you know, we've learned that healing our community is, is a large part of offering a balanced educational system. So, so we hope to offer that model where we are and, and elsewhere. That is awesome. I don't, you don't even need a uh, you don't even need a you don't even need a brochure for your school. You can just show them this picture. It's like no, I'm in. We, this is what we do. It's like I'm in. Did are you feeding the fish? How did you get that picture? You, it was it was just a fluke. <laughs> just a parent is taking a picture as we going oh. away to do our our surveys, and a a fish just came up out of the water. <laughs> that's that's crazy cool. Thank you. Um, we're we're gonna um, we're gonna do a quick breakout, six or seven minutes, um, and give you a chance to share your case for place. How would you convince um, a, a classroom of parents that you want to leverage the uh, community as classroom? So let's do that for six or seven minutes in a couple groups, and then uh, pick somebody to to share a couple of bullet points on the case for place. Liz is going to put us in rooms, breakouts. Yes, you should get a note. Everyone should have a note on the bottom of their screen asking them to enter a breakout room. Hey, Lori, thanks for sharing your story. No, that's cool. Hey, Aaron, thanks for sharing, guys. Appreciate that. I think we're all still in the same room, at least I am. Yeah. Um, did you guys get a notice on the bottom? How about a uh, cool, interesting panel, right? They're just. No. I you love these guys. Tom, I've, I've had a chance to. I just mute it, Tom. <laughs> yeah, we're still in. We're still in our room together. Yeah, I'm still here. I haven't seen a note. I love you guys. You guys, I, I just, you inspire me every time we. It, I know it's only been a couple times, but every time I get on the phone with you, I'm, I'm or the Zoom, I'm writing notes, taking <laughs> links, and listening to your passion. It's so cool. I hope we get to do this again. Yes. Kiana, it was Mules and Men that Zora Neale Hurston wrote while she was in O'Galley. 
I couldn't remember that. <laughs> I was like, was it their eyes were watching God? No, it wasn't that one. <laughs> yeah. well, I went to a retreat um, a couple of years ago with my husband in Mexico and the, the location, a woman owned this um, a couple acres. And what she did is she made sure nobody could walk around with shoes. That was her rule. She's, you walked in there, it was, out, it was outdoors in the jungle. And what they did to, for safety reasons, they would have somebody come in and rake the pathways. So you never, you just walked on the, and my husband's totally freaked because he's like this really, really weird guy that has to wear shoes. And I never wear shoes. And I'm like, yay. And he, he was just like, it took him days. <laughs> oh, I think, I think we must be in the room with ourselves and like Nate and Tom are in another room. So we have uh, Mason is in the room with us. Can you hear us, Mason? I can. Oh, no. there you go. That's a, you guys talk. We thought we, I thought I was just with the panelists here. <laughs> I don't know what happened because it won't let me resend you guys things. It's saying you just haven't joined. Oh. Um, so you were only able to put the other people into the rooms. And Tom got into his because he was logged in twice, remember? Yeah. And then I just muted him wow. because he heard him speaking on the other one, I believe. We were probably in a different I link. Sent you one too, because I didn't know if you wanted a breakout room. Yeah. And I still see Tom's screen. Like he can you see that too? He like mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's his second computer. <laughs> oh, that's why. Okay. Uh, I see, I see. Got it. Okay. There's too much technology happening here. <laughs> that's great. Tom's probably having fun. <laughs> yeah. it's nice and small we got about five panelists in a room together and then tom is in a panelist with about three or um with the group of three or four he's with the group yeah well i i, I how many know, people are all together so there's about 15 participants on oh. Okay, that's more than I was expecting at this time of the day on the last day of the conference. Yeah, I'm glad that some that people showed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would love to visit your school, Ayana. Um, and yeah. it sounds like so amazing. Um, someone's in a waiting room. I see that. Um, I think someone's so sleeping. Amazing. I think. Somebody's sleeping with us right now here. <laughs> Maybe it's your, it's your giraffe again? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's um, construction going on next door. So I have okay. to. <laughs> I, had a, I did have a funny story. I was on a board, a school board, and we were all remote one time. And um, we, one of our, pan, our board members fell asleep and did that and snored. And we couldn't turn him off. We couldn't mute him because no one had their um, hosts tools so yeah. the host had gone away and that uh, through the whole board meeting they were snoring <laughs> it was awful <laughs> and they could they thought it was me and i'm like no it's not me and i couldn't get my my mute to come back on it was awful but kiana you're on the west coast yes i am mm -hmm. you come out this way ever <laughs> Um, you know, right before the pandemic, I had, uh, I was like two days away from uh, going to Florida because we were thinking about expanding to, we we're prepping to be in it, expanding into Florida for this school year. Um, and I already was, yeah, I was going to be there, spend about a week and a half there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, mm -hmm. prior to this, I was always on planes. Yeah. If you head this way, let me know. We have a garden cottage here where you could stay and you can have some fresh food and and set up hop skip and drive here it would be awesome here the the uh the public infrastructure system here is yeah. difficult. it's very yeah. difficult yeah. um yeah. we still live in an area where um our school campus is separated from a historically black community um by railroad tracks and us1 so those students can't easily physically get to our school and they're less than half a mile away. Because you know? from, a walk, from a safety perspective, that's one of the sort of rules of transportation. 
if a, and for walkable, right? To determine if it's walkable, they can't cross a major street and they cannot, absolutely cannot cross a railroad track. Right. So there, this community is isolated, you know, so they're, they're isolated from access to choice. They're isolated from literally being able to walk to the lagoon. The lagoon is less than a mile away, but they can't walk to it, you know? So, so there, it's interesting when we're still in these areas that are pretty homogenous and not yet seen kind of these, um, you know, this flourishing of awareness regarding access that people are still living in communities that have seen very little growth over the last four to five decades. Yeah, that's true. I think everyone else joined us or everyone's back in with us now. Tom, oh, hello. <laughs> I'm going to unmute you now, Tom. You're, you're back um, on the hot mic. Back. Thank, Thank you. you. I was just going to say, Ayana, there's this uh, famous picture that oftentimes people show of uh, South Africa, and it's a, like an aerial shot, and you can literally see like wealth and prosperity like here and there's little there's no railroad track or anything like that there's golf courses there's trees there's green grass there's big homes and then you just see like for whatever reason you just see like these little shanties right and so it would be interesting if you all did a similar like had a drone take a photo right of that demarcation and what that to, to Nate's point earlier, what that says about our social political and our economic sort of communities, because this is the same community, really, but just divided literally by a railroad track and what that means. These, these are the stories of our places. Yes. How did, this, how did this come to be and, and how did the how did the individuals who live less than a half a mile from me have a completely different lived experience? Right. Exactly. In the same space. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Everyone's back. Tom, you're back with us. I'm back. Um, I'll, I'll have Laurie just give us a headline from our um, our breakout group. Well, I feel like I got, got a, a more than my fair share of airtime there, but just um, I think there's a lot of great and, and I, well, I think one point for us is that the place-based nature of the courses we offer was never something we had to sell. Like, I think it was something that there was just, you know, intrinsic, innate appetite for amongst students. And I think their parents got it as well. And so I think I honestly, you know, from my experience, I think the more we offer, the more um, the opportunities will be seized and it'll spread. Um, and I, you know, and I, I feel free to have Aaron jump in because he was just in the middle of sharing more of his ideas with our group when we when we um, reconnected with the full group. Yeah, I was just saying two things. One that uh, place-based education is just like one arrow in a larger quiver of, of say culturally responsive practices or initiatives, and the other is that when you work on a place-based uh, uh, initiative, you leave a lasting say uh, community garden, a, you leave a lasting change. And even though in maybe in 50 years, it'll be um, something, something there, there's always a history that, that some people will know when you, if, if you can access it and find those people. Um, yeah. And maybe one other just quick thing to add in there is that my consortium, because we're locally based in, you know, in the same region, we've always been thinking locally and about making connections with local experts and local organizations and businesses and field experiences. But because of the pandemic, it's kind of opened us up to thinking about like opening up that kind of place based thinking of how might we bring in guest experts that are DC lobbyists that can weigh in on an American politics course, you know, and so that is something that is kind of currently in expanding mode for us that's worth mentioning. Um, is there, a, can we get a, a quick report out from another, um, another breakout? Aaron, Ayana, we were just, it was mostly just us in the, 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 the breakout room that we had. Um, and I think just one of the most profound things is um, Ayana, 
uh, was talking about there's a rail uh, uh, railroad uh, in between this community. And so, as you know, Tom, in terms of safe walking and for schools and sort of the regulations around that, um, in order for a child to be able to walk to school, they cannot cross a railroad or a, a main highway, um, a main street. And so that prevents those kids from going to this school these other schools and having choice, even though it's less than a half a mile away. And then I highlighted uh, a, a very famous picture that was on, uh, it was on Time Magazine, I think that was in, in 2019. And it shows, uh, it, it identifies South Africa as being the most unequal uh, country. And there's a picture overhead that a drone has taken of one side of the street being like amazing and then uh, the other side not so amazing and why that is and what that does going back Back to what Nate was saying, the sort of the socio-political, economic, and ecological sort of uh, uh, what the, those things are for places. And I dropped the time cover in, in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Did we have one more? I can quickly go in ours. Uh, just we had a we have a, an eclectic bunch in our group from a, a lot of different backgrounds and um, I think the, the, we all shared that uh, it's an interesting idea. And I think um, one of the questions that was asked uh, by Teresa, uh, Teresa was uh, just, how does this apply across social dimensions and not just ecological dimensions? So we talked a little bit about that and then ran out of time, so. Great, I appreciate it. And speaking of running out of time, we're gonna do a 20 minute sprint through a set of uh, tools that um, that you can use to bring place-based learning to life. Um, so I'm going to invite my, uh, my colleagues to um, be brief because we, um, we have a lot to share. We're going to go through all of these categories uh, quite quickly. We're just going to give you some headlines on tools that might be useful to help bring place to life. Uh, I'm going to start with Crosstown High. It's in this old Sears Distribution Center. Um, Keanu, you'll like this one because they fanned out across the community, visited neighborhoods, and invited kids to answer this driving question. What challenges exist and how might we design uh, or adapt solutions? So they, they fanned out, visited the community, used design thinking to build solutions, uh, and then they uh, did a research project and presented their answers. So great example of place-based project that was an English project plus an AP history project. It was a research project. So there's uh, super valuable from many different standpoints. They used a lot of different tools, including uh, um, Google Docs to collaboratively edit and present. Um, on the communication front, um, video, video editing, video presentation is more important than ever. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, nonprofits called High Resolves that has a project called Videos for Change. Kids around the world are making videos about the difference that they're making in their local community. So great example of the use of video. Um, Aaron, and we have a we have a school in Carlsbad. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Go ahead, Tom. No, just uh, t tell us about uh, skill building tools. So we have a school in Carlsbad, and it's Cavalier uh, Middle School, and they do Cavalier Middle, Middle School, and they do uh, 3D printing, but they ship all their 3D hands. They ship them overseas to fa for families for pennies on a dollar. They're like they end up being about a couple dollars each and they send the kids the kids that have no hands who have lost it, um, hands in um, accidents they send them little prostheses and these kids have been doing this for years it started with a um, a wheelchair try they had a um, they were uh, had it was another empathy project project based learning and they were trying to redesign a wheelchair for this one little girl with cell, with, who had cerebral palsy to make it more user friendly for her but it led to other uh, many other things and now this class just does this uh, type of work and it's all about empathy and learning to uh, who your audience is and uh, you know working together planning and it's a huge hit very cool 
Uh, Nate? Yeah, j uh, just two different examples. Just when we think about uh, design thinking and solution making, it's often technology based. And so at Teton Science Schools, we have a K-12 design tech program that we're building that's personalized, but it starts with uh, technology as simple as sewing and building and making, because um, we couldn't find anything nationally that did all of that. Um, and then it ends with coding and robotics and things like that. Uh, every project or every unit um, is badge based and has a community impact project embedded in, into it. So every time they're learning a skill, they're figuring out how to make a difference at the same time, which is the core of design thinking. Um, love that. I, uh, Nate, I added Design Tech Eye to the yeah. chat. That's another school that has a freshman prototyping class where they, they teach kids um, how to represent their thinking through drawing, through sewing, through making. So I uh, appreciate that. This is a, a picture from Maker Academy in New York City, another example of a, of a community connected school with great uh, maker resources where they, um, they also teach prototyping um, and every student does projects um, that try to deliver value to, uh, to customers in the community. Yeah, I think Tom just, oh, go ahead, you can, that's fine. So this is one of our schools in San Diego County. This is one of the ones that directly um, we directly oversee. And it's our 37E uh, CB uh, court and community school. So a lot of these students have been through the court systems, either through incarceration or on probation. And what they've done, they're building a cafe. They, they wanted to meet the need. They, they purchased an old building. They have an old building. That's where they have their school. But they wanted to meet the needs of the community and kind of blend in with the community and to become good partners and um, good stewards of that community. So they're building a coffee shop to serve the family or the, the community. And the kids are going to be working in the coffee shop, to be in, doing the budgeting, growing the food that's going to be used in the coffee shop. You know, if they're doing snacks and sandwiches and things and soups. And it's just an amazing long-term project. And uh, there is, it's going to be um, farm to kitchen and they have their own kitchen and they're going to be serving the coffee. Um, just a wonderful project. I'd like to real quickly just to give this uh, Gretchen Rhodes, the principal there, her, her quote. It is not, it is my goal to make the space at ECB feel like a place of not only learning, but of belonging. We, are, we use, utilize art, gardening, entrepreneurship, and eventually coffee and food where, when our cafe opens. She believes that creating this warm and loving learning space coupled with building strong relationships there will be anything, anything would be possible. I love this, Erin. I me just <laughs> love this so, so much. It makes me think of all the social enterprise programs that are popping up um, and also what, uh, uh, um, um, what has happened with uh, Homeboy Industries here in LA, which is a wonderful model of something very similar to di this. In fact, I, I want to, if you are, if you're connected with Homeboys um, there, I'd like to connect with you because we would like to model some of that over here in San Diego. Wonderful. And I think there's also a program in Denver, if I'm not mistaken, but yes, I'm happy to connect you with Homeboy and the program in Denver as well. Outstanding. Thank you. Erin, um, if we were in San Diego, you and I would be leading a group through the harbor using AR and VR. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to ask um, Ayana to, to talk about how they use it too. But what do you see across San Diego County in terms of AR and VR connecting to place? Well, we have a lot of a population that has never been outside of their own neighborhood. And so we're, what we're trying to do is you trying to use AR and VR, VR specifically, to get kids to see things differently and experience them. So it wouldn't be a one-dimensional, so it's almost like almost a three-dimensional experience or four-dimensional experience. And one of the things we talked about, Tom, is we were going to, what our original plan was, we were going to put everyone in 3D glasses and we we're going to walk through the harbor, not the water, that we walk through the, the side of the harbor and walk through. And everything that we saw, if we saw a plaque, we were going to have a VR code and the code was going to lead to us, us to the history of what that plaque meant and who put it there, why it was there, markers in the city. There's so much in the city that we could, if we brought it to life and we had a history lesson, right? It, within 50 feet, you could learn so much about the space and area you're in. 
And it's with IR and VR experiences that we can do that. It's, uh, it's super, super cool. I'm looking forward to a great pair of um, maybe the next generation of Google Glasses where you can put them on and walk around the block and, and um, experience um, data sets and information through a different um, lens of awareness, right? The, and think about Nate's triangle that one day you're experiencing the economy and you're thinking about who lives here and what kind of living do they make and who owns the property here. Um, and the next day you're thinking art and architecture and you're diving into that data set. Um, the next day you're diving into to, uh, culture um, or biology that you can experience the same block with uh, different um, data sets through, uh, through AR. So the future is really bright for these tools to uh, help unlock place. Ayana, hey, are you doing anything with AR and VR? We do. So we were really excited um, with iNaturalist.org because we've been using iNaturalist for some time and they recently released Seek by iNaturalist, which allows you to use augmented reality to identify species uh, within your environment. So we do thing like, uh, things like bio blitzes within our uh, spaces. We also do creature censuses and um, we've been able to identify invasive species using Seek. Um, you know, so just this idea that we can bring in something that's not really there into our space and, and interact with it and, and identify um, specimens. Uh, our, our children, as young as our Journeys program and their five to seven year old, their heads explode. You know, like that, that yeah. butterfly's not really there, but look, it's there. <laughs> you know, so it, it really doesn't, intensify the experiences and um, allows children to use what they know and add it um, to these wonderful new augmented reality yeah. additions. Very cool. Um, I was in, uh, Aaron, I was in your neck of the woods um, in February and took this picture of fifth graders using video conferencing. Uh, it seemed pretty novel at the time and now, and now 50 million kids are using video conferencing, but these kids are using Nepris to connect with experts in uh, the Cone Valley School District. Uh, they connect with experts to learn about a project at the beginning, and then the uh, experts will get back on a video and, and help assess uh, the quality of their project at the end. It's been great to see kids around the country, uh, more kids being able to access experts connected to project-based learning. Have you been to Cone Valley, Erin? Oh, absolutely. I, I, am, I went there uh, probably right in maybe January or February. They had a little tour there for some folks from Digital Promise came as uh, some superintendents. So I, I got a chance to tag along. Going into kindergarten classrooms, the kids knew what their purpose was. They knew right. what they wanted to be. They knew what their strengths were. They were talking to us about, well, here's my strength. And I'm looking at these little kindergartners thinking, oh, what is a superhero? No, you know, I'm really good at oral presentation, but I'm not so good at writing <laughs> and how they were expressing themselves because they're put in given situations where they're, they're allowed to talk to professionals outside of the education field. So every child there is given an opportunity to have numerous interactions with people outside of the teaching profession, which is unheard right. of because usually students go through it for 12 years and only see a teacher. Yep. Uh, every kid uh, goes through 54 community connected cycles where they think about yep. their strengths, interests, and values. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, Mason dropped in a chat with Ed Hidalgo about that uh, system, so ch check that out. If you guys want to follow somebody just absolutely inspiring, it's Ed Hidalgo. He's the, just a wonderful human being, and um, I just recommend having a conversation with him. Thanks. Uh, Kiana, um, are you talking about this LA yeah. high school? Yeah, so this is um, losing our high school. It's in Sentinel Sentinella Union High School. 
uh, district in Lawndale, which is just uh, right outside of uh, Los Angeles. Um, they have a multimedia careers academy. And what they found, uh, again, was the real challenge of, of bringing their learning, um, whether it was Photoshop or multimedia production, um, filmmaking, uh, photography to life in a real world experience. Um, and they had opportunities to get these students um, off campus professional jobs. LA Sparks, LA Times, Riot Games, Grammy Museum, you name it. But as many of you all know, LA is one of the biggest and one of the most populous cities in the, in the country. And so that was really difficult for them to do without transportation um, and really provide this community-based experience. So we're happy to, to partner with this particular high school and make that a reality. Students no longer have the challenge to get from uh, school, their school-based learning to their um, career or to their um, off-campus professional internships. Uh, there's no barrier to that anymore with partnering with us. And I'll drop a link to a video that there, there is that shows that. Thank you, that's great, great example. Um, a whole other category is uh, modeling and simulation uh, check out AI for All, a great Oakland uh, nonprofit that is um, that helps communities around the country create AI-focused summer programs, particularly for girls. They also have an open platform that any high school can use uh, to bring open uh, machine learning tools to young people. Uh, Concord Consortium is a great nonprofit, concord.org, that has... Um, uh, check out the podcast that Mason just dropped into chat. Great um, modeling tools. They also just stood up the Messy Data Coalition, which I love. Uh, me we, too. We hope that we hope that place-based learning is really about uh, dropping into the data of place and inviting kids into to complex problem solving. We think place can be a great introduction uh, to to data science. Um, and we added a couple other cool uh, modeling tools there. Uh, data visualization tools are getting more and more sophisticated. We've talked a little bit about sort of geo-oriented um, information. The last day that I was in Newview Studios in February, uh, I saw two different groups do a uh, walking tour of the same uh, geography. One group was studying economics, um, race, and class, and they were charting um, economic data. This group was studying, um, it was a biology group studying the olfactory system, and they were charting smell. Uh, the type, duration, and intensity of smell. You can check the young lady's notes, um, the smell notes. And then they, they created um, data visualization, some of them graphical, some of them three-dimensional. So I, I love this idea of just walking around the block, given the topic that you're studying, uh, collecting data, and then looking for ways to uh, present that data using uh, data tools. Aaron, uh, give us an overview of a, a couple of the uh, project tools that kids are using. So these are some of the ones that we're using right now. And I think Nate actually um, introduced me to Wakelet. Is that correct, Nate? No, that wasn't me. <laughs> okay. Well, somebody, well, there's a, it's like a, um, it's, it's, good it's like a Padlet. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a good, so it's like a Padlet. And these are all different ways to share experiences with kids outside of, um, you know, online. And so we need a place for that to be curated and we need a place to house it. So these are just places that we've gone to to get that, um, to share that information. And we use Flipgrid quite often, and that's that's a real easy one. And you could even use that with parents. Yeah. Parents are even getting involved in Flipgrid because it's easy to take a picture, do something, send it in. Projects are a great way to uh, connect with place and teach kids how to manage projects. One of the most yep. important things they can learn. Nate, how do you track what kids are learning? Yeah, so this is the uh, the holy grail here, right? How do we make all this stuff count if it needs to be counted instead of uh, for standards or things like that. So we've dabbled in all sorts of different things and have settled on building our own custom solution on top of Canvas LMS uh, to do competency-based assessment and teaching, uh, which ties nicely into Tom Mastery Transcript Consortium, which we are also part of at the Science Schools. Um, 
I, I want to give Brian a chance to um, make a plug for the Clio. He just dropped that link in. Uh, Brian, do you want to talk about how you use that? Yeah, uh, the Clio app is really amazing. Uh, it was uh, designed by a history professor here at Marshall University. And it's basically, um, it's, I, I, the, the best way I can describe it is like Pokemon Go for history. Uh, it's got these place-based uh, areas um, well, of history or science, or you can do walking tours or any number of things. And when you uh, are able to do it, it's open source. Usually it's, it's uh, set up with a, a professor or a teacher who helps their students to create their own entries. So the, the kids get to walk around and make the videos and do the pictures and set this thing up. And then you can go and do walking tours or you can uh, have individual spots. You can go into your community and open up the app. And just like there with Pokemon, you can see where the different gyms and different spinning things are. You, you see, oh, there's a historical spot in my community. I never knew it was there. It's two doors down from me. I never knew it was there. And so you can embed videos and pictures and, and data and all this stuff. It's open source. It's free. And you can have your students add to it. It's absolutely an amazing resource. We had uh, him do a workshop for us at the National Youth Science Camp with our delegates this summer virtually. And he did a lecture about it. Um, and uh, it's just been a really, really cool tool. Very, uh, very cool. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, Ayana, as the, as the uh, um, head of school here, I wonder if you could take us out with a kind of a one minute take on uh, agency equity and community. How, how do you go about trying to create agency equity and community at, uh, at Verde Eco? Well, thank you. I, I don't know that I, I can speak for one minute, but I'll try. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we've learned a lot of uncomfortable decisions as a collaborative school community. We consider ourselves to be cooperative. So we have a, a collaborative governance model that includes students and teachers and parents on our board. Um, so when we talk about student agency, we are immersed in it, <laughs> we're living it. Um, but there's also this idea of our place um, and, and honoring our place and also understanding what the unique challenges of our place are. So here in Brevard County where we are, um, it's pretty racially homogenous. You know, our, our general community is about 98% white, middle to upper class. And we are, you know, um, we're separated from diversity in some very physical ways. So I spoke about that, those railroad tracks and US one kind of barring a historically black community from accessing the, the lagoon and even accessing the historic district um, in their own community. Um, but there is a, a push within our school community to understand that even those that don't currently have a voice in our space need to be given access. Right, so yep. we're not we're not fully a community, um, and we're not fully equitable if we don't actively find ways to to break down barriers to access. Um, so we have partnered with um, outreach agencies on within the Booker T. Washington community, which is on the other side of those railroad tracks, to say what can we do to break down these barriers, and what can we do to start to include within our school's growth, this idea of uh, uncomfortably moving forward and, and having these conversations yeah. about how do we improve our place. Um, no, I, we, we appreciate that. I mean, that's, um, I think what brings the, this panel together is that shared commitment to agency uh, equity and community. We love what you're doing at your school. Tiana, thanks for trying to make learning more equitable through transportation. Nate, thanks for your leadership on this topic. Aaron, great to work with you again. Thanks everybody for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, if you tweet, tweet about the power of place uh, and share your stories with us. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks Tom. Hey, Tom.